Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Telebration Part 2. Telebration is part of the Connecticut Storytelling Center, and tonight we have another set of six fantastic tellers from the Institute Library Story Share Group, led by Arnie Pritchard, who is a historian and a fantastic storyteller himself. He has put together an incredible group of tellers, which meets once a month throughout the year and is generously open to all tellers new and experienced. The Institute Library houses our group, and we ask that you consider making a donation to the Institute Library by visiting institutelibrary.net. Our first teller for the evening is Elizabeth Anton. Elizabeth has been telling stories ever since the tender age of two, when she memorized Dr. Seuss's Green Eggs and Ham and pretended to be reading to impress her uncle. She began writing her stories down sometime thereafter and has spent her life telling stories in a variety of forms. She is learning how to craft compelling stories at the Institute Library from her personal experiences. She has also told stories at the New Haven Festival of Arts and Ideas, Buttonwood, Clinton Arts Council, Songs and Stories, and Speak Easy. She's delighted to be part of the vibrant Connecticut storytelling community. The title of her story is The Stowaway. Take it away, Elizabeth. Thank you, Denise. Well, last winter, I decided I was going to learn how to ice skate again. I mean, I hadn't ice skated since I was a little girl, since my grandpa used to take me. And boy, did it show. But no matter. I'd wobbled along the edges of the rink, feeling every inch the princess that my grandpa used to tell me that I was. Mi princesita, he would say. My little princess. Oh, it takes me back to the time when I was a little girl and my mom used to drop me off at, uh, at my grandma and grandpa's house on her way to work. My grandpa, they used to take care of me and my grandpa and I used to play this game relentlessly. We'd roll out a layer of pink Play-Doh and I would take a cookie cutter in the shape of a giant penny and I'd stamp that down and my grandpa would, would wipe away the excess. He'd help me transfer the penny into the bank and help me count each time we put one in. When we got to 10, we could go shopping in the kitchen. To pay for a glass of milk and two cookies, my grandpa would help me count out the pennies and then he would help me count how much I had left. That's why when I went to Head Start at the age of three, I already knew how to add and subtract. The irony of this of course, is that when my grandpa arrived on the shores of America in 1924 as an immigrant, he not only did not speak any English, he also did not know how to read or write. My grandpa used to sit me on his lap often and tell me stories, regale me with stories about his childhood in Ecuador. I was enchanted by my grandpa who ran away from the mean nuns in the orphanage way up in the mountains. Well, my grandpa's father was a colonel in the Spanish army. He had squinting blue eyes and a big blonde mustache. His mother was an Incan princess with long black hair braided down her back. And when she died in childbirth, the colonel was so sad that he left my grandpa in the care of the nuns in the orphanage, high up in the mountains. Well, my grandpa escaped from those nuns when he was 14 years old. He went in search of the fabled city by the sea, which was on the other side of the mountains. He spent many days and many nights wandering through a dark, scary forest, and one night, a big black mountain lion trapped him high up in the tree. And, and for three days, he couldn't eat and he couldn't sleep and he couldn't drink until finally he shook his mighty fists and beat his mighty chest and let out a mighty roar. And the mountain lion got so scared that he ran away. Well, when my grandpa got to the edge of the forest, indeed, there it was the city by the sea. It was Guayaquil. My grandpa had never seen the ocean before. And there were boats 
big, huge boats, bigger than he ever imagined possible. And he was so curious, he went to go and explore on one of those boats. And that's how he became a stowaway. <laughs> well, when he stepped off the gangway about three months later onto the shores of Manhattan, it was winter. And he was wearing the only thing he owned, a pea coat that had been given to him by a crew member. They'd taken up a collection for my grandpa and put $11 in his pocket. That was a fortune. I've often wondered if my grandpa stood in bread lines that winter, if he sheltered in church basements. I don't know. He never said. But what I do know is that he got a job as a carpenter at one of the shipyards in Manhattan and helped build ships for most of his career. He met my, my grandma, who was an immigrant from Spain, and they married and moved to a tenement in the Bronx where they had my mother and my uncle. It was that apartment where many years later, he would one day take care of me. Grandpa lived in New York for many, many years, but he never, never much liked the winters. I mean, his blood refused to thicken. He didn't like spending time indoors though, either. So he'd often take me on outings. He'd take me ice skating. The joy of ice skating, truth be told, really helped me live with the pain, forget the pain of the violence that was going on in my own home. And when I was seven years old, my grandpa bought me a set of white ice skates. They had pink palm, pink pom-pom shoelaces that made me feel, you got it, just like a princess. I had a, a black, I mean a black, a pink knit cap and, and, and a matching scarf and matching gloves. And my grandpa would take me to the ice and he would gently, gently let me go. And he'd say, Ten cuidadito, mi princesita. Be careful, my little princess. <sighs> grandpa was the joy of my life. And I wish things had stayed that way. But when my mother died in March of 1986, my grandfather and I were estranged. We hadn't spoken for a number of years. I have a vivid memory of my grandpa kneeling at my mother's coffin, keening, sobbing. Mi hija, mi alma, he was saying, my daughter, my soul. And though, and though I felt his grief, I did not go to comfort him. The rift happened one day, it was one day when my mother and I had a huge knockdown, drag out fight. I was 16 and way past the age when she could just hit me with impunity. We were shouting in the kitchen and she slapped me and it stung and my eyes welled up with tears. But this time, this time, rather than swallow down those tears, I just upped and let out a primal scream and slapped her back. Well, she screamed and my grandfather came running in and at first he just looked shocked and, and then he sort of looked from one to the other and it dawned on him, I guess, that I'd hit my mother, his daughter. And I'll never forget the expression on his face. It turned from shock to anger and then to disgust. And he looked at me and he walked away. I was devastated. You know, I felt so betrayed and so deeply hurt. It's just that up until that moment, it hadn't occurred to me that I was in fact princess number two. You know, as, as, as much as my grandfather loved me and he did, his loyalties of course were with his daughter, my mother. So I guess he just, in his mind, in his heart, he just couldn't accept that I had hit her and shown such disrespect. Um, yeah, so I, we fell out. So anyway, grandpa died the year after my mother of a cerebral embolism, but everyone said that he died of a broken heart. By that time, 
our relationship had long been irreparable, and I was so bitter that I did not go to his funeral. So last winter, when I was learning how to skate again, I'd wobble onto the ice looking every inch like the Michelin man, wearing three bulky layers and a pink, of course, pink crash helmet. And I'm wearing wrist guards and elbow pads and knee pads and even a tailbone protector, which frankly looks like an oversized diaper. <laughs> but no matter, I feel just like a princess. I imagine I'm dancing across the ice, wearing a pink skating costume, sleeves fluttering in the breeze as I gather speed. I close my eyes and I see my grandpa standing at the edge of the rink, his blue eyes glinting with pride. I feel his tender, fierce love and I know he's keeping me safe. Now, all these years later, I can cherish the wonderful things about my grandpa. And I'm deeply grateful for the ways in which he helped shape me into the woman I am today. Look at me, grandpa, I whisper. Look, I'm still your princess. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Brava. Our next teller is Nisreen Ramal with her story, The Flower Thief. Nisreen is a humanitarian expert from Lebanon who has 15 years of experience serving refugees and vulnerable fellow human beings in the underserved communities of the Middle East and North Africa. Nisreen's world and life changed in ways she never thought was possible by the stories of the people she worked with and served through her career. She realized the magical power of storytelling and what it can create. She is now here with us to share stories from her world and continues to connect and break stereotypes through wider audiences. Thank you, Nisreen. Thank you, Denise. Hello, everyone. Um, so my story is from Lebanon. Sunny days have always been my favorite days of the year. I really don't care if it's snowing and cold or if it's steaming hot, as long as it's sunny. There's something unique about the delicious golden light that makes me feel joyous and alive. During April of this sci-fi series like year 2020 I was staying at the house of my friend Jenny in Woodbridge Connecticut Jenny's house is located at the dead end of October Rod Hill dead funny word to say come to think of it there is definitely nothing dead about that place anyhow It is a big yet cozy house. And the light comes from all the windows that are in every room and the windows were big. And it was surrounded because of its location. It was surrounded by the woods from the back and from the right side, like a semi hug without having the arms closed as if it's still calling and welcoming those coming in through the front side. It reminded me so much of the house I grew up in back home in South Lebanon. Being there felt very peaceful. It felt like I was away from the world and from the pandemic where I had deers and birds visiting the backyard every day and trees and early spring flowers for neighbors and friends. One day and after um, a full week of nonstop rain, I woke up to a golden ray of sunshine. Finally, I thought to myself, I rushed down the kitchen, prepared my freshly ground French pressed coffee, 
put on my cozy sweatshirt and walked outside to the backyard with a cup of coffee in my hands. I could feel the sunlight penetrating my skin on my face with its warmth and the fresh air with the smell of the woods travel through my nose to my lungs. I stood there sipping my coffee as if I was meditating and my eyes laid and as my eyes laid on the freshly opened daffodils, I smiled. The daffodils laid by the end of the backyard and the edge of the woods. So basically they were almost in the woods. I thought I should go pick them. And I stood there looking at them as the memory of a little mischievous girl hit me like a very strong wave. Nana, that little girl, I can still see her as if it's today. Tiny, petite, long, dark hair, wide, dark brown eyes, and wheat colored skin, which is what Middle Easterns call the bronze skin. Running down and running around town, always carrying some sort of a plant, animal, or fruit in her hands. She was very popular and known to be a fearless animal and nature lover. Yet, no one knew that little girl led a secret life and performed secret operations on the side. I mean, she seemed like most kids at that time, wanting to be outdoors, exploring, doing adventures, you know. Nana lived with her family on the top of the Sunshine Hill, which overlooked almost 80% of her little town in Marjayun, which literally translates to the meadow of water springs. She would wake up every morning ready for the adventures she had planned the night before, and that would always include some cute wickedness to capture some creature of some sort, even if it was a school day. But of course, there was her secret operations, which she very discreetly and unsuspiciously planned. You see, Nana was a thief and a very good one. She had so many spots that she had carefully and smartly picked as her targets. To conquer and her raids were always successful. She had an obsession that and, and, and no one noticed that obsession, or maybe they didn't take it seriously. But her obsession was growing dangerously. And why wouldn't it? Never once she was caught or even suspected. You see, in Nana's town, people took honor in having beautiful front gardens where flowers and roses were their most delightful, precious treasures. In the evenings, you would see the family sitting on the front porch together, enjoying snacks, refreshing drinks, and conversations. While one or two of these people would be in the gardens at the same time, you know, jumping into the conversation back and forth. And you can also hear them bragging about their gardens. So you can all imagine their reaction when they started discovering that their precious treasures are being stolen. Oh boy, or in this case, oh girl, these people were really getting aggravated. But the little cute thief was so entertained, keeping everyone wondering like a little rascal who was very confident that she would never be caught. I mean, the girl had a strategy, you know? So she would always cutely ask for permissions to pick up fruits because she knew that would be always granted that's the culture thus no one ever would suspect her now because her house was on the top of the sunshine hill every day after school the bus used to drop nana where she had to walk for around 10 minutes up to her house and of course being herself 
Nana always turned this five days a week adventure, a trip into an adventure. One specific house that was located just under the road where she made that daily trip from the bus stop to her home was a huge target for her. You see, the house had a humongous, rich, beautiful white rose tree that laid behind a huge, old, dark, rusted red gate with fences from both sides. The roses were white with this pink and honey color at the bottom of the petals by the crown. And they smelled so deep, like you could just drown in them. Nana was raiding that rose tree almost every day on her trip back from school. She would approach the house quietly, peek down on the right side of the fence of the gate, and then peek from the left side of the gate, make sure no one is seeing her, do a twirl in the street to make sure that no one in, no, there's no one in the street to see her as well and walk very slowly on her tiptoes and her tiptoes into the gate pick whatever her hands can reach and run as if she's being chased by cats or dogs now the landlord of that house who took so much pride in his favorite Rose Tree was getting aggravated and restless. He had to catch the thief. And one day, he finally noticed that his treasures were being stolen on a specific time of every day. And it was so close. He feels it in his bones. He's going to catch the thief. He plans and he hides, monitoring and watching for the thief to come by. That day was very sunny, beautiful. Nana stepped down from her school bus, did her daily routine, checked the fences, looked down, looked up, turned right, turned left. No one is there. And then she walked again on her tiptoes into the gate and reached with her little tiny hands to pick the two flowers when she felt two hands were picking her ears and a voice yelling, the flower thief, I caught the flower thief. The little girl crumbled she was red, she was yellow, she was purple. Her heart was racing. Oh my God, she got caught and red-handed. Now the people in the town, they all heard, you know, and everyone was like, who's the flower thief? Who's the flower thief? Everyone knew who was the flower thief. That little girl felt like she will never have her raids again. Nevertheless, that was in the reality. Her passion and her obsession were way stronger than her. Her adventures and her life as a thief kept going, even though all town knew. So they were basically waiting for her by their front doors to leave their neighborhood or to leave the area where they live and make sure she's gone before they close the door and go inside. She got her punishment. Her parents were really upset and mad at her, but that never stopped her. You see that girl had so many names. Most of them were pet names given by her siblings and her family. Nana, Nina, Nusa. Her real name was Nisreen. And the flower thief became her most popular name in her hometown. As I was standing on that balcony in the backyard of Jenny's house, 
I put my cup of coffee on the side and I stepped downstairs and I went to pick the daffodils. I was smiling, I was happy. I felt like I was stealing again. And then I video called my mom to show her the daffodils, I have flowers. Hello, she said, it's like, hey mom, look, it's very nice over here. It's really sunny. Look what I have in my hands. And I picked the flowers to show her. And her first reaction was like, oh no, not again. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you, Nisreen. Our next teller is Kathy Shufro. Kathy likes to say she's a beginner here, but I've heard her tell lots of stories. She normally tells stories as a writer. She recently wrote a remembrance of Margaret Holloway, New Haven Shakespeare lady for Northfield Mount Hermon magazine. Kathy's story title is Who's Your Mama? Kathy? Thanks, Denise. In August, a couple of friends of mine asked me to house it for them in Vermont. And they had a couple of cats. One of them needed a pill every day. And I made a game of seeing how well I could crush the pill and mix it into the food so that the cat wouldn't notice it was swallowing this bitter pill. My instructions were not to give wet cat food to the other cat, the long yellow and white one. But I gave him some anyway, because I've known the sting of sibling rivalry. When I got home to my empty house, I thought, I think I'll get a cat. And I found a phone number online for a purveyor of cats. I called her up. She asked me some questions. And since apparently she decided that I was worthy of owning a cat, she invited me to come to her house on the following Sunday. I drove up to her house in a rural part of Connecticut, about an hour from my house. And when I got to the door, she wasn't as I expected, a sort of frumpy, strange woman. She was vivacious and stylish, wearing black capris and interesting glasses and a blue surgical mask. Behind her in the kitchen, I could see a couple of people around cages with kittens in them, but she directed me into a small room by the front door. And there were two cages there. One had a black cat and one had a white cat. Now I liked the black cat. He was all black. He had green eyes and he had a big fat cheeks. He was really cute. When he came over to me to be petted, the cat lady turned to me and said, Kathy, Kathy, this is wonderful. He's chosen you. I was a little skeptical, but I, I went along with it. And after doing some paperwork, I was ready to leave, but I had one last question. Was there a way to train the cat not to go into my bedroom? The cat lady looked chagrined. I could see that her estimation of me as a cat owner had plummeted. Why wouldn't you want to sleep with your cat? She asked me. I just shrugged. I know she was disappointed, but I was happy. As I rode home, I thought about what to call the cat. Now he already had a name. The cat lady had told me that she'd found him on the streets of New Britain. She hadn't been able to pick him up though. And a little girl named Barbara who was nine came along and said that he had been her cat when he was a kitten. And she was able to pick him up. She handed him to the cat lady and she said, take him, his name is Negro. Now I wasn't gonna call my cat Negro, but I decided to honor his Latinx heritage, at least temporarily by calling him Gato or cat. And I find, his real name eventually when I got to know the cat's personality a little bit. When we got home, I opened the cat carrier and he disappeared for the next seven days. I caught occasional glimpses, but a lot of times I didn't even know where he was. When the cat lady called every couple of days to check in, I told her that I was being very patient with the cat, allowing him to acclimate, and she praised me for not trying to force the issue. 
In any case, when I gave him food early in the morning and in the late afternoon, it would always disappear within a half hour, even if I didn't catch a glimpse of him eating it until Sunday. That was the eighth day he was living with me and he didn't eat his food. And by afternoon, I realized he must have gotten out of the house. Possibly I had forgotten to latch the, the storm door in the front. I felt like actually an unqualified cat owner, but I figured he'd come back eventually because he'd be hungry. And so I put food on the front steps and on the back steps in the morning. It wasn't touched by mid afternoon and I realized that I needed to call the cat lady and fess up. I was not looking forward to that call. But when she answered, she said that it was great that I'd called. She thanked me for calling. And she said that she would da be down at my house at dinner time because dusk is the best time to find a cat. She was very upbeat. But as she hung up, I heard her say, oh, God. Well, she arrived at dusk and brought a station wagon full of big cat traps. They're kind of metal cages, pretty large. There were four of them and she dispersed them around the yard and baited them with tuna, tuna fish while I followed around behind her. She showed me how they worked. And then she said that she'd have to close them down around 9.30 or 10 to avoid catching wild animals. And she sat in the driveway in her car for two hours. I couldn't invite her in because it's COVID time. I felt kind of bad. Then I saw her flashlight, you know, snaking around the yard as she closed down the traps and I heard her drive away. The next day she was back. I didn't join her then, she did the same thing. In our daily phone call on Wednesday, I said that I would take care of the traps that night. She reluctantly agreed. When I went out to close them down around 9.30, in the rain and in the cold, I found a huge raccoon in one of the traps. That raccoon was like a beach ball and so heavy that I wasn't able to turn the trap over without putting my fingers right close to the animal and holding on to the mesh of the cage. It was scary. I ran inside after the, after the raccoon ambled off and I took off my wet ski jacket and I thought, how did I get here where I'm freeing raccoons from traps? The cat lady, I didn't want to disappoint her so I kept putting the food out and on Thursday, she didn't say she was coming down, but I noticed that in the afternoon there was clothing, a piece of clothing on each trap. There was a polar fleece jacket on one of them and a vest on another and something else like a t-shirt on the other. It was very eerie to see those sort of flat pieces of clothing sort of suggesting the absence of the person who had worn them. The idea was, I guess, to make the cat more comfortable by providing this, a familiar scent, the scent of the cat lady who had taken care of him for about a week before I met him. On Thursday, she did call me and say that she was going to consult with a medium and the medium would be able to tell if the cat was alive and perhaps where he was. The next day when we spoke, she said that the medium had confirmed that he was alive, but she didn't know where the cat was hiding. The next day, Friday, she said that the medium um, hadn't needed to come to my house, but had done this long distance. And the cat lady herself didn't come that day. I sort of liked the break from her visits. The next day, when I was bringing in the cat dish at night, I saw headlights in my driveway. And before I could make it into the house and, and get to the front window to try to figure out who it was, I got a phone call from the cat lady. And she said, oh, hi, 
Sorry, I'm in your driveway. I just want to say you're just such a good sport, Kathy. I saw you bringing in the cat food and you, you're just a trooper to keep putting out that food. And I thought, wow, she's kind of spying on me. I mean, that felt a little weird. We agreed that one more day and we'd give up the fight and she was gonna come down and get the traps. I suggested I could bring them to her house but I guess she wanted one more chance to look for the cat. And so the next day, Sunday, in the late afternoon, when I brought in the cat food from the backyard, I felt kind of relieved. I don't have to do this anymore. I don't know where the cat is. I never got to know him enough to really love him. I hope he's okay. And then as I was about to go into the house, I saw the cat. He was just sitting there, calmly looking at me on the edge of the yard as if it was perfectly normal. I went into the house calmly, even though I didn't feel calm. I opened the front door and I propped it open and I put the cat food on the front steps. I brought another dish and put it in the entry room to the house. I turned off all the lights and I waited. And within 10 minutes, I saw two glowing eyes in the dark entry room of my house. As quietly as I could, I turned around, went out the back door, wearing only socks, ran around the house, got back into the, into the house, and scared the cat into the other room. I closed the door and I thought, this is great, I could call the cat lady and she's going to be happy. She was already on her way down to my house. And when she arrived, she brought in a cat carrier fished the cat out from behind the dresser where he was hiding, and closed him up in the cat carrier. I stayed outside, waiting for her, sitting on the porch, and she came out and sat with me. She thanked me for being such a good sport, as she put it, for persisting. And then she said, I know I've been a little weird about this cat. I mean, usually I don't get this involved in the cat's that I give to people. And in fact, I kind of wish I could get out of this cat rescue business because I'm tired of it. And I just can't stop because of the suffering of these cats. I feel so bad for the animals that are living on the streets. But this cat was a little different. I felt intensely about him because that little girl had raised him from the time he was a kitten and her mother had moved into an apartment with a boyfriend who had three cats. And they had forced that little girl, Barbara, to put her cat on the street. And she's been texting me. And all week I've been lying to her, saying the cat is fine. Now I can go home and take pictures of him and say he's fine and it will be true. I don't think he's the right cat for you anyway, Kathy, because he's gonna keep trying to run away. He's used to living outside. And so she took the cat and put him in her car. I saw the headlights of the car recede as she backed out of my driveway. I listened to the car, the drone of the car as it drove down the road with my cat and my cat lady. Thank you. Hi. So our next storyteller is Denise Santisteban, uh, telling my own country. Uh, and Denise uh, has been telling stories in public for four years. This is her fourth celebration. Uh, and she has also told that the mouth off, Saul Fusner's songs and stories, New Haven storytellers, storytellers New Haven, uh, and Story City Troop. As a part of the team at the International Festival of Arts and Ideas, Denise curates the tours and the storytelling program. And Denise has been working in performing arts for her entire life uh, and has always liked how stories enhance people's lives. Denise Santisteban. Thank you. I grew up in Hayward, California 
in a very middle class suburban tract housing development across the bay from San Francisco. Our house was a couple of blocks from the Nimitz Freeway. And when the windows were open, lie in bed and listen to the onrushing traffic, the never ending race of cars, and pretend it was the roar of the ocean. There were kids in my neighborhood, on my street of all ages. We would play together, we would ride our bikes, play dolls, and in the summer, we would play hide and go seek until it was dark and our parents came out to call us in. My elementary school, which all of us went to, was nestled up against that Nimitz Highway, and I could walk to school by myself, which is what I did most days. When I was in second or third grade, I was playing in the schoolyard with my two friends, Elizabeth and Belinda, when two girls from another class came up and started teasing us and calling us names. I stood up and I grabbed the only weapon I had at hand, dirt. I took two handfuls of dirt and threw it at their faces and they screamed and ran away. And Belinda, Elizabeth and I thought we had won that battle. Later on after recess and I was in the classroom, the door opened and a teacher came in with a little girl. And I heard the little girl say, that's her, that black girl over there. But I didn't pay attention to them. I wasn't black. But then she pointed directly at me and said, that's her, that little girl there, she did, that little black girl, she did it. And my face grew hot and my stomach clenched up. This was bad. And, and not because of the dirt throwing but because she had called me black. I, I mean, I knew black kids at school, but I, I wasn't one of them. But I knew in that moment, it didn't matter. I was a different color than all the kids I went to school with, at least most of them. And after that, I tried to blend in, to be just accept it with the crowd. Um, probably subconsciously, I only picked white friends. I dressed trendy, never did the hoops. And it, yet things would still continue to happen to remind me that I was not part of the general look. I did everything I could, though, not to be labeled Mexican. It didn't help that within my own household, my father perpetuated this idea. If I went out with friends and stayed out in the sun too long and came home too tanned, I was in trouble. And then there was an incident when I was a kid and I went to the Walgreens with my mom. Well, I'm sorry, Woolworths with my mom. And she stayed upstairs to shop, but I went downstairs to see the fish and the birds. And while I was down there, the security officer came up and started accusing me of that I had stolen a skipper doll that I had in my hand. And as no matter what I did and tried to tell him that this was my skipper doll, he wouldn't listen. And he started marching me up the stairs to the security office when we encountered my mother, who was just fierce. And as they talked this over, I realized it had more to do with other things than the doll. I also was never allowed to take any of my toys into a store with me ever again. Many years later, I was working at the North Face. And I went upstairs to the executive level. I was looking for a coffee mug and I went into the kitchen and was rummaging around the cupboards. And this woman walked in and asked me, are you cleaning the kitchen? Um, no, why? Why do you think that? And when I went downstairs and I was upset and told my white colleagues what had happened, they couldn't understand why it bothered me. Really? Do you think she would have asked any of you if you were cleaning the kitchen? And then one day, I was driving to my job as a stage manager at the mill 
in Mill Valley, which is a very upscale area just north of San Francisco. And I decided to stop at the mall on my way in. And when I got there, the parking lot was just jammed, but I spotted an open space the next aisle over. So I pull my minivan around and start up the aisle to get to that spot. On the other end of the aisle, a blue BMW saw the spot as well and started coming down the wrong direction. And they parked their BMW in front of the spot so I couldn't get in. Now this really ticked me off. So I got out of the car and started yelling at the BMW. And then the door opened and this tall white man got out, started yelling back at me. And then he started calling me racial slurs and said, why don't you go back to your own country? In my head, all I could think was my own country? Kind of think maybe my people were here first. And he turned and started getting back in his BMW, but paused with one leg in the BMW and one leg still out of it and turned to say to me one more time, go back to your own country. That enraged me. It infuriated me. And all I wanted to do was run up and slam that blue car door on his leg and break it. But I didn't. It took everything in me to turn around, get back in my minivan, and drive to the theater. I was still upset and fuming when I got there. And I told a friend about what had happened. And she looked at me in disbelief and said, are you crazy? You got out of your car? Do you know how badly that could have ended? You and some rich white guy? Who do you think they would believe? And I knew she was right. I was never going to blend in. I was always going to be that little brown girl throwing dirt. Except from that moment on, I was going to be very proud of her. Thank you. Thank you all very, very much. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our next teller, Denise Page, with her story, 2020 Vision. This celebration marks Denise's first anniversary of storytelling. She embraces the opportunity to both straighten, strengthen communities internally and build bridges between community that storytelling provides. She is the founder of Ubuntu Storytellers, a training and storytelling ensemble that facilitates difficult conversations about race and social justice. Denise. Thank you, Denise. I'm 17 years old and happy. Why wouldn't I be? I'm enjoying a week at the State University and I'm looking pretty cute. I've got on my beige suede over the knee boots and my soft as butter pumpkin colored suede coat. My hair is picked out perfectly in my Angela Davis style afro. You know that feeling when you know you're looking good? And college guys are everywhere noticing. I see them seeing me, seeing them. I'm one of about 60 high school seniors from across the state who had been to a summer program on that campus the summer before. And the school had invited us back so that we could see school in session. It was winter weekend. Well, I was in the process of checking out this dude across the student union when three of my peers from the summer start approaching. And I can tell by their walk and their look that they're up to something. Michelle starts dramatically. Please say you'll come. I stretching where I have, hoping, hoping they mean somewhere on campus, the pizza parlor or maybe the new ice cream place that had opened up on the, on the farm on campus. 
but no, they wanted me to go with them off campus to a boys prep school. <laughs> a boys prep school, I say to them, aren't there enough boys here with a grand sweep of my arm? Well, it seems, yes, there were plenty of boys here. They just weren't the right boys. You see, it turns out that all three of these girls had crushes on three boys who happened to attend the same prep school. And they said this was their perfect opportunity to visit them. Couldn't I see that? For one, the campus was closer to where they went to school than it would be if they were home in their respective towns. Well, they were actually wrong about that. We were totally geographically ignorant. We didn't know where we were, but they thought that it'd be a good chance to check them out. The other reason this would be an opportune time is because Karen had a brand new to her Mustang. And what would be a better maiden voyage for it than to drive to this prep school and surprise these three guys that they had crushes on? And the third reason it was a good idea, unfortunately for me, was that I was friends with all three boys. You see, I was the admission ticket. Didn't I see how the universe had conspired to create this moment just for them? <laughs> well, no, I didn't see that at all. I wasn't interested in going. I didn't want to go. But you have to come, they said, you have to come. We barely even know them. If, if you don't come, we'll look stupid. <laughs> I refrained from comment. There were so many reasons this was a bad idea. One, we didn't even know if the boys would be on campus. Maybe they had gone home for the weekend. And then there was the larger reason. We were guests at this campus. You know, I don't think we're supposed to leave campus, I said to them in my last ditch effort to get them off this very bad idea. But they said nothing. Instead, they just looked at me. They looked at me as if I had just abolished any chance they had ever for future happiness. I had dashed their chances for love, marriage, and family. Well, truth is, their looks didn't really cause me all their pain. I wasn't feeling their pain. But I was feeling some kind of guilt. You see, I had been having a really, really good year and maybe a sense of largesse kicked in. I had just started in January going to another high school. I had graduated from my local suburban high school in December, and I had made a deal with my parents that if I had done so, they would allow me to attend the urban high school in the nearest city for the remainder of the year. With all of my studies done and my college applications off, I had a fabulous time. I so enjoyed going to a high school where most of the kids were black, like me. These were the boys I dated in the sporting events that I went to. I was having a fabulous time. Now, there were their share of haters. You know, girls don't take kindly at that age to girls from out of town coming and having jibs on their boys as well. They don't like sharing them that way. And I didn't pay much attention to it. I knew it was there, but it didn't really ruin my flow. I had a good time despite that. But as I sat there this day with these friends looking at me so imploringly, I gave in and said, okay, I'll go with you. And so it was on this exceptionally warm January day in, Nova in New England, I found myself en route to the boys prep school ill-advisedly unannounced and unwelcomed, perhaps. I'm sitting in the back seat of the car opposite the driver. I pick up my par big green hard-covered book, Blackboard Jungle, that I'm reading, and I hold it close to my face. I settle in the car and turn, leaning gently across against the car door. I'm lost in the story of the idealistic new teacher and the challenging students that she's teaching. And I'm drowning out any conversation of my friends chattering. They didn't really need me to engage in their conversation. I had already made my contribution by agreeing to go. After a few miles of writing and reading, I looked up to give my eyes a rest. 
And as I looked out the window, I noticed what an incredibly beautiful winter day it was. It was that kind of day in New England where the snow had fallen, but it was still pristine and shimmering. And I was thinking, you know, this really is a great day for a country ride. And I was beginning to feel pretty magnanimous about myself. And I was glad that I had relented and was going to usher my friends to their heartthrobs. And I was about to tell them so when one of them yelled, Doc! I never heard the screeching of the brakes, nor the thunderous crash, nor the shattering of the glass. I never felt the car spinning around, nor the glass from the window as it splintered into my face. The next thing I do remember hearing is that my friends were encouraging me to lie down on the back seat of the car. And I said to them calmly, I can't, I can't, there's glass there. I don't know how I knew I couldn't see, but I guess I sensed it. They spread a blanket on the back seat and encouraged me to lie there until the ambulance came. In the ambulance, a little girl's voice said, Daddy, Daddy, am I going to be all right? You're okay, you're okay, darling, you're okay. It's this young woman I'm worried about. Who, I wondered, who are they talking about? And why can't I see her? Well, Lauren was the only other person who was injured in the car. She had a broken nose. When we get to Mount Sinai Hospital in Hartford, the surgeon reattached my eye and did his very best to minimize the facial scarring that they knew was going to ensue. Well, my left eye, which had always been my weakest eye, had to do much of the heavy lifting as my right eye was under bandages waiting for the wound to heal. Those days were long, but I was mercifully, uh, they gave me plenty of drugs and it did help the day to go pretty faster. It was difficult to pass the time, you see, because I couldn't read. The irony is reading had gotten me into this mess, but my vision was so diminished and my eyes so sensitive to light, there was no way I could read. They had to keep the blinds in the hospital room closed and they, they kept the lights off except for when the personnel came in to change the dressing on my wound. Well, they were concerned as to whether or not the attachment was going to stay. Was my eye going to be able to remain? And if it did, would I have sight in it again? Well, in my traumatized haze, I started fantasizing about the glass eye that I would get to select. If my eye, if the, re, if the surgery didn't hold, then I would get a glass eye. There was a famous model at the time named Verushka, and she was reputed to have one blue eye and one green eye. And I thought, well, if we're going to get a glass eye, I might as well have some fun with it. Let's see. Do I want a hazel eye like my cousin? Or should I just go for it and get a green eye? Well, the six weeks finally passed and the day had come for the reveal. On that day, my parents and a crowd of white coated personnel surrounded me at the bedside. They're looking at me waiting to take the bandage off my eye for the last time and see that I could see and that the, the healing had started. I was prepared for the fake smiles I knew they had prepped just as they looked at me. They gathered around and then smiles passed from lip to lip as they looked at the bandage, at the scar underneath the bandage. And they leaned in closer and said, oh, she looks so good. Oh, it looks so good. She looks so pretty. <laughs> I knew they were lying. What were they going to say? Oh, my God, she's a monster. Somebody handed me a mirror and I pushed it away. My father handed it back to me and, and I knew I wouldn't win this battle of refusal. So I took it. 
And thankfully, when I looked in the mirror, my vision was so severely diminished, I didn't see anything but a blur. While my parents were packing up my overnight case, I devised a plan. I noticed the box of bandages on the nightstand next to my table where the nurses had always gone to get the bandages as they would redress my wound. I took the box and slid it into my purse. I had a plan. You see, I was expected to return to school on Monday and this was Friday. And I knew that I was not ready to face my peers yet not scarred and not disfigured. After all, this was the school I had just transferred to with the boys I dated and with the girls, some of those girls I mentioned who were haters, who were mean girls. I couldn't imagine how much fun they'd have laughing at my disfigurement. I just wasn't ready. Well, that weekend my house was flooded with adult guests who all told me, Oh, you're still pretty, and oh, thank goodness, the surgery worked, and aren't you grateful your eyesight is coming back? <laughs> well, no, frankly, because it had begun to dawn on me that the, really the most horrible part, the tragedy of this, was going to be my facial scarring at 17. You see, I was so worried about that, about being imperfect, that the blessing of restored vision was greatly overshadowed. I spent the weekend avoiding mirrors and my reflection, praying that Monday would never come, but despite my best efforts to will it away, it did come. So I had to execute my plan. I chose my hottest outfit, blue, because that was my best color, a blue mini dress. I had been told I had good legs, and one thing I knew, they hadn't been scarred. So my blue mini dress and my blue matching window pane stockings. And then my middle brother, my brother Mark, he picked my Angela Davis fro out to perfection once again. He did my grooming so that I wouldn't have to look in the mirror yet. And then ready for school that Monday, I checked to make sure that my plan was still going to be executed. One quick phone call to my two besties who attended that school, Margie and Kathy, and then my father drove me to the next city over so that I could go. He dropped me off at the front door, and as soon as he pulled away, I ran around to the side of the building, to the gymnasium entrance, the entrance that was locked during the day because it was only used at night for sporting events. It was there that my girlfriends would be waiting for me. When I got there, they opened the door and greeted me. This was a perfect place for me to re-enter school because not only was no one in the hallway there, but there was a bathroom there. And so forming a human shield, they ushered me into the bathroom, protecting me in case any nosies came along and should want to stop and stare. We go into the bathroom. And after all the greetings and the effusiveness of being back together, I reach into my pocketbook and I hand them the box of bandages. Kathy takes the box and looks at it and hands it to Margie. And they look at one another and they look concerned, frightened. Uh, do you have anything else in your purse? Oh, thinking through, thinking through. oh, do you need more? Do you need more? Oh, do you need more? No, no, sis, we don't need more. <gasps> tape. Oh, my God, I forgot. Tape. How can I be so stupid? I forgot tape. No, no, not tape. Not tape. Kathy comes over to me and puts her arm around me. She takes the box I had given her and holds it up very close to my face. Sis, these aren't bandages. These are tissues tissues. I couldn't walk through the hallways of high school with tissues on my face. Tissues. And so it was, I exited the bathroom that day with my two best friends, with my new, as yet, unseen by me scar. And I entered the world of sympathetic and supportive peers, not the Blackboard jungle, at all, 
boys who whistled at me and girls who yelled down the hall, don't worry, girl, you're still pretty and you're so brave. I didn't know if they meant it or not. I didn't really care. On that day, I knew I was grateful. Grateful that I didn't have a glass eye. Grateful that my vision was getting stronger day by day. Grateful that I had friends and families that cared for and supported me. But most of all, grateful for a little box of tissues that forced me out of hiding and into wellness. Thank you. That's incredible. And we're very grateful that you are just as beautiful as you probably have always been. Thank you. Our next teller is Saul Fusener, who is the Director of Creating, Creative Writing at the Educational Center for the Arts in New Haven and the host of Songs and Stories. For a long time, his teaching especially concerned the teaching of conflict and genocide. His story tonight is called Willie. So. All through the fall and the winter, we had been teaching the Jewish American teenagers and preparing them for the Holocaust trip to Poland. And now it was spring and we were about to go to Poland and we were visited by Willie, one of the Holocaust survivors who would join us on the trip. Now, I had been teaching Holocaust studies for almost a decade, but Willie had lived that history. I so wanted to connect with him. I so wanted to be someone meaningful to this person who had lived such meaningful history. But when he came in front of the students, I saw a man who was just complete rage, a man who seemed to have no sense of humor anymore. He had a damaged left eye. It was tortured looking and the lid hung just a little bit over the top of it as it sort of bulged out and looked so different than his normal right eye. And when he looked at the students, he said, you must not enjoy this trip. This is not a tourist trip. This is a trip for you to witness, to witness the horror. And that was my whole impression of Willie, an angry man, a man who had had all the fun, all the humor tortured out of him. And then I learned that as we went across Poland, Willie was going to be my roommate in every hotel. The first night we got into Krakow and I didn't get such a sense of Willie as a person, but I did find him to be quite cordial as a roommate. And even though he had lived in New Jersey for decades and decades since the Holocaust, he still struggled with his English. And that evening he told me, I cough so much, I feel like I am smoke three packs. And I wrote it down in my little book where I like to write down quotes that I like. The next morning, we were going to the Ramah Synagogue. And as I was the cultural educator on the trip, it was my duty to tell the story of the Rabbi Yom Tov Lipman Heller, who is buried in the Ramah Synagogue. Now, the interesting thing about the Rabbi Yom Tov Lipman Heller is that most of the great rabbis are buried in graves that are right behind the synagogue itself. But the Rabbi Yom Tov, one of the great Jewish sages of the 1600s, is buried by the far wall, a place of seeming dishonor in that cemetery. And I was to tell the story of why that was so. So I went up to the grave of Rabbi Yom Tov Lippmann Heller, and I stood right in front of it. And across from me were all the teenagers of the trip, the teachers, the rabbis, the doctors who were with us. 
and I told the story of Rabbi Yom Tov Lippmann Heller. Now, in the 1600s, it was the duty of the rabbi to go around and collect alms from the town to support the synagogue. And so Rabbi Yom Tov Lippmann Heller would go to every house in town and ask for alms. And there was a famous miser in town, Yasala the miser. He was a very wealthy man. But every time Rabbi Yom Tov Lippmann Heller went to the house of Yasala the miser to ask for alms, Yasala the miser would always say the same thing, not this week, not this week. I know, I know that I can eventually give, but right now times are hard. I, I cannot give you anything. And this got Rabbi Yom Tov very angry. And eventually he said, to Yasala the miser, if you don't give now, when you die, you will be placed in the worst part of the cemetery. You will not be placed in, in a place of honor in our cemetery, but you will be placed in a place of dishonor. And Yasala the miser said, that may well be, but I just, I'm sorry, I just, I can't, right now I cannot give. And so the Time came when Yasla the miser died and the elders of the synagogue all met together and Rabbi Yom Tov Lippmann Heller said to them, this was the deal he made. We are going to bury Yasla the miser in a place of dishonor in the cemetery out by the far wall. And so it was. But in the days after Yasla was buried, Many less alms came to the synagogue. And Rabbi Yom Tov was puzzled by this. And he went to the butcher and he said, since the death of Yasla the miser, it just seems like I'm not getting as much money for the upkeep of the synagogue. And the butcher said, well, yeah, when I gave money, it was mostly not my money. It was money that Yasla would provide for me. He said, I don't want to make a big deal of things but I'm giving you some money to give to the synagogue so that you can look like you're participating as an active citizen in this community. And Rabbi Yom Tov was scandalized by this. And he went to the tailor and he said to the tailor, I just heard fr from the butcher that Yasla the miser was the one who was giving money that he was donating to the synagogue. Is this true? And the tailor said, well, sure. Do you think I could afford to give to the synagogue as much as I did? No, it was Yasla the miser. He gave me the money. And this was the same all through town. And when Rabbi Yom Tov returned to the elders of the synagogue, he said, I've done a terrible thing. Not only was Yasla the miser not a miser, he was the best type of giver, the giver who wants nothing in return. And I had him buried in the place of dishonor in the synagogue. And I think because of this, I too should be placed by the far gate when I die in the cemetery. And it was so. And after I told this story, Willie came to me and he threw his arms around me and embraced me. And from that moment on, I saw a different Willie. I saw a man full of joy, dancing everywhere in Poland, singing Yiddish songs, just enjoying life. Willie and I became like two college roommates. He was 42 years older than me, but the two of us would sit in our hotel rooms all across Poland. We would sit on the beds in our boxer shorts and our white t-shirts with Polish vodka and our Dixie cups. And we would drink and we would regale each other with stories all across Poland. And the only time that I saw that man of rage again was when we went to Willie's hometown of Kielce in Poland. Now, after the Holocaust in 1946, Kielce was the site of the worst post-Holocaust killing of Jews. 46 Jews were dragged from a house in downtown Kielce and murdered and drowned in the river that runs through the town. 46 Jews killed by the townspeople with the aid of the police 
of Kiltsa because one Catholic boy had disappeared for a few hours. The Kiltsa pogrom. Willie had not returned to Kiltsa after the Holocaust, but he knew this story. And he told this story to us on the banks of the river. And I remember Willie's dark face in shadow, backlit by the sun. I remember how all we could see was that tortured left eye, that piece of skin of eyelid over that tortured eye and the sun like fire coming out of that shadowed head. As he said to us, if you have to piss, piss now, piss on this town, piss all over this town. And it was the last time that I saw Willie's rage. Later in a hotel room, he said to me, you know, in, in New Jersey, I have a woman and she is Polish. And he said this with some shame. I knew by now that when Willie said the word Polish, he meant Polish Catholic. He was ashamed of this. So I said, Willie, you live in New Jersey. Where are you going to find an octogenarian Jewish woman who speaks Polish to be your girlfriend. Forgive yourself. She's the perfect girlfriend for you. And Willie liked that. And our bond grew stronger. And one of the last times I saw Willie was at Auschwitz. Auschwitz-Birkenau. We went through the big gate and we went to the train tracks. And one of the other Holocaust survivors who was with us told us his story of entry into Auschwitz at the train tracks. But Willie didn't want to talk about Auschwitz to the, to the teenagers, to our students. But he walked with me past the women's barracks of Auschwitz-Birkenau. And he said to me, you know, I speak beautiful Polish. I didn't know what he was getting at. Of course, of course he spoke beautiful Polish. Polish was his language. He said, I speak Polish so well that when I was here, they thought I was a Pole. And I knew this meant, this meant that they thought he was a Polish Catholic. And Willie said, when they freed the Jews from Auschwitz, I had to stay for another week or maybe it was a month, I had to stay at Auschwitz because I was a Pole and they did not know I was a Jew. And during that time that I stayed there, when I get out of here, I'm going to go to that place in the world where they've never heard of a Jew. But when I was freed, do you know what I did? I went straight to the house of the first Jewish family I could find and I had a meal with them. And that was the end of my Holocaust. Now, after the Holocaust, Willie was reunited with his brother. And in New Jersey, every day of their lives, they would visit with one another. Every day, except when Willie was in Poland. When Willie was in Poland, he was my brother. Thank you. Thank you, Saul. I love that story. It's really wonderful. I would like to thank all of our tellers tonight, Nizreen, Elizabeth, Kathy, Denise, Paige, and Saul. And most of all, thank you to our audience. We hope you have enjoyed and been touched by the stories you heard. If you're interested in joining the Institute Library Story Share group, please join us for our next virtual meeting. Good night, everyone and stay safe.